This video is a symbolization review. In it, I try to hit the highlights of all the things that are most commonly missed on the tests. Let's jump right in. While the guests were not unimpressed by the flan, they disliked both the tapioca and the custard. I really do believe that it's valuable to rewrite sentences, and so I'm going to do that. While what we're doing, of course, is reducing it to the logical words, the punctuation, and the important capital letters. So while the guests were not unimpressed, notice there's two synonyms for not there, so let's include them. While not unimpressed by the flan, that's F, comma, they disliked both the tapioca and the custard. To make this maximally clear, I'm going to go ahead and write disliked both T and C. All right? Here's the important stuff. While not on F, disliked both T and C. All right? A great place to start is oftentimes to find the main connective. When you only have one comma, it's telling you where the break in the sentence is, and that break is going to be associated with the main connective. Can you see that in this case it's the word while that's working with the comma? And of course while is an ampersand, and so while is placing an ampersand at the comma. There are four things that mean and but sit at the front of the sentence and confuse people. They are although, though, even though, and while. Always be on the lookout for them. Well, ampersand is the main connective is great news because nothing ever needs to jump from one side to the other, so we have a project in front and then another project behind. The project in front says not on F. Well, in fact, if you just read it right off of what those words, you would just write tilde tilde F, and that is perfectly acceptable. What does F stand for? If you go back to the original sentence, the guests were not unimpressed by the flan, F itself is the positive sentence, the guests were impressed by the flan. And then we're double negating it. They were not unimpressed. Of course, we also know that if you have two tildes, whenever you have a pair of tildes, you can just drop them off. So it would be perfectly okay to ignore those tildes and write F. In fact, when I see things like not unimpressed, I typically mentally just ignore those things and cross them off. Okay, on the back side, we've got disliked by disliked both tapioca and custard. This is a complex negation. We know that the trick for complex negations is to distinguish two basic patterns. And those two basic patterns are tilde P, ampersand, tilde Q. And what does this mean? It means negate both parts. Negate the P and negate the Q. Versus tilde P and Q. This means negate the pair. But if you want to understand it, the best way to think about it is negate at least one of them. If you're going to negate the pair, the only way to do that is by negating at least one of them. Either P or Q, or possibly both of them. Negate both versus negate at least one. So when we know we have a complex negation, the strategy is to identify the simple sentences and then decide how many we want to negate using our intuitions. So, what are the simple sentences? Disliked both tapioca and custard means they liked the tapioca and they liked the custard. Those are the positive simple sentences. How many should be false? Don't let yourself get thrown by the existence of a word like both. Sometimes this means negate both, but sometimes it actually means this down here, and we'll see examples like that in other sentences. So let's read this to us, to ourselves. They disliked both the tapioca and the custard. Did they like the tapioca? No. Did they like the custard? No. Okay, so they both need to be false, and we'll put tildes on both of them. In fact, this complex negation is not very difficult. But if you see the basic idea here, hopefully we can extend it to more difficult ones. Of course, you could do the same thing down here, tilde T and tilde C. Either one of these is 100% correct. 
Now you're probably saying, ah, oh, wait a second, what about the parentheses? Notice this is actually a string of ampersands in both cases. You could leave the parentheses out. Now, to be sure, a set of parentheses like that does kind of feel more natural. Next sentence. It's false that neither Itchy Scratchy nor Aristotle is a philosopher. This can be a rather tricky sentence. If you think about it's false that neither, it almost just blows our minds. But if you remember the trick for it's false that, this is much easier. It's false that, it's not the case that, it's not true that, tend to be ways of negating an entire sentence. And so when I see that it's false that, I suspect that that will be the main connective for the entire sentence. And indeed, what it's doing is negating everything after it. And if you conceptually divide the sentence this way, it almost becomes trivial. It's false that. What's it's false that? Well, in the parentheses, we're going to symbolize neither Itchy, Scratchy, nor Aristotle is a philosopher. That's a rather simple, complex negation. Neither Itchy, Scratchy, nor Aristotle is a philosopher. Complex negation with three parts. What are the parts? Itchy is a philosopher, and also Scratchy is a philosopher, and Aristotle is a philosopher. If I tell you neither Itchy, Scratchy, nor Aristotle is a philosopher, how many of those have to be false? They all have to be false. And so we would put tildes on all of them, just like that. And here is our symbolization. This is the correct symbolization for the sentence. It might bother you a little bit that you, you might say, but wait a second, I thought Aristotle is a philosopher. Well, notice the sentence says, it's false that, that neither of them is a philosopher. So we're inside the sentence, we are saying that none of them are philosophers. But then we're saying it's false that none of them are philosophers. Our minds don't work especially well on negations, so there's some tricky things going on here. But the truth is, if you break it in, break it up like I'm suggesting here, um, it's not a tricky sentence to symbolize necessarily. Supposing that the flavors of Jello are infinite, then it's impossible to make them all unless you work really, really fast. All right, let's rewrite this sentence. We know that supposing that means if, so I'm going to write if, and then that the flavors of jello are infinite. Well, notice there are some tricky negative prefixes in this sentence. Infinite means not finite. Likewise, impossible means not possible. Now, I recognize that this is actually very tricky, and I would probably avoid putting something like this on a test. The negative prefixes that you'll see on the test are involved with things like dislikes, distrusts, unhappy, pretty obvious things. But take this as a reminder to be on the lookout for those. And so what I'm going to write is if not J. I think that's the easiest thing to say. J stands for the flavors are finite. And so if they're not finite, comma, then it's not possible to make them all, so we want to say then it's not M, comma, unless you work really, really fast, so unless F. Okay, this is the important stuff. Now having a look at what we've got here, there's something that should be leaping out at you and say, please work on me first. And that, of course, is the unless. Every time you see unless, you want to cross it off and write in if not. So here's what we really care about. If not J, then not M, if not F. Now this is still not trivial, but when you look at this, does it look familiar? We have got two ifs, one, two, and we have three parts, one, two, three. What does that mean? Ah uh, yes, it's our favorite distinction. We have got P arrow Q arrow R, or we have P arrow Q arrow R. You know this game. We've got to decide 
we have two ifs and we have three parts. So we have these patterns here and we have to decide which one we want. Well, when you're making this distinction, the first thing that you want to do is to identify the R part of the sentence. Well, is the R part not J, not M, or not F? Notice that not J has an if in front of it, not F has an if in front of it. What follows if has to be an antecedent, so not M is got to be the last thing. We can just superficially tell this. So, let's put not M at the end. Then in front of it, we can, it, it almost never turns out that you have to change the order of the other parts. So let's just go ahead and put in tilde J, arrow, tilde F, arrow, tilde M. And now we just decide, do we want the parentheses around the front or do we want it around the back? And the way to decide this is to try it. Put the parentheses around the front and then read it the right way. You know that when we have the parentheses around the front, I've encouraged you to read that first arrow as causes. Ultimately, arrows have nothing to do with causation, but to help our intuitions, it's a good idea. This arrow we're going to read as standard if then, and it's going to put an if out in front. So, this arrow is causes, this arrow as standard if then, so it itself is then, but it places an if way out in the front. And let me see if I can read it. This would say, if the flavors of jello being not finite cause you not to work really, really fast, then it won't be possible to make them all. If the flavors of jello being not finite cause you not to work really, really fast, then it will be impossible to make them all. That's a very difficult sentence to say, and try as I might, it still felt really awkward. That's a very good indication that this is probably not the right symbolization. Let's try it the other way. So for the other way, we want to keep the letter, the sequence of the orders the same. The sequence of the letters the same is what I mean to be saying. Tilde J, arrow, tilde F, arrow, tilde M, like so. But this time we put the parentheses around the backside. Now we know that this formula is equivalent to a different one that uses the ampersand, namely P ampersand Q, that in parentheses, arrow R. Our intuitions work much better on the ampersand version. So if we want to understand this, the best thing we can do is put an ampersand over here as well. Tilde J and tilde F, all of that in parentheses, arrow, tilde M. And now let's see if we can read this. This would say, if the flavors of jello are not finite and you don't work really, really fast, then it will not be possible to make them all. That sounds almost plausible. So yes, either one of these formulas is 100% correct. Of course, if both of these are correct, there are other things that would work as well. Yes, you can write tilde F and tilde J. The order on the ampersand clearly doesn't matter, so that would work. But you could also do it this way. You could say, if you don't work really, really fast, then if the flavors of jello aren't finite, you won't be able to make them all. That works too. All four of these would be correct. This one would be a problem. If you're not wearing both a fuzzy wig and a red rubber nose, then you may not enter the sanctuary of the clowns. It's a rather peculiar sentence. Um, I guess it's my fault. Let's rewrite it. If you're not wearing both a fuzzy wig, let's leave the both in here. If not both W and N, comma, then you may not enter the sanctuary.
So if not both W and N, then not S. This is one of the worst situations we see. It is a complex negation after if. For whatever reason, our intuitions just get turned inside out when we have a complex negation after if. The standard strategy for complex negations is to identify the simple sentences and then use our intuitions to see how many to negate. But it's tricky in these cases. Let me point out that there are really just two options that are reasonable. Do you want to say tilde W and N arrow tilde S or would it be better to say tilde W and tilde n arrow tilde s. The sentence says, if you're not wearing both a fuzzy wig and a red rubber nose, then you can't enter. So how many of these do you have to have to enter? You have to have both to enter. We're going to make it so you can't enter. This sentence says, if you're lacking at least one of them, then you can't enter. This one says, if you're lacking both, then you can't enter. Which do you like? An awful lot of people will choose this one, but this one is incorrect and this one is right. Think about it. There's a fuzzy wig and there's a red rubber nose. How many of these do you have to have to get in? You have to have them both. So if I take away even one of them, if you lack even one of them, then you cannot get into the sanctuary. This is the correct one. I don't know why our intuitions have such a bad time with this. Many people want to say, oh, it's because of the word both, right? That's what's, I mean, it's definitely the word both that's hurting us here. But many people want to say, well, look, it says not both, so it's got to mean this over here, right? But stop and think about the sentence. If you're not wearing both of these, then you can't enter. Isn't that clearly just saying, if there's even one that you're not wearing, then you can't enter? If you're not wearing both means if there's at least one that you're not wearing, then you can't enter. We understand that somehow, but when you try to call it to consciousness, it feels very vague and very confusing. I know how bad this is. Um, I, one more point that I should make. Some people say, now wait a second, if you're not wearing a wig and you're not wearing a nose, then they're definitely not going to let you enter, right? Well, yes, it turns out that if this is true, then this one is also true. However, they're not equivalent to each other. This one is, in fact, making a stronger claim. What would this sentence say in English? This would say, if you're not wearing a wig and you're not wearing a nose, then they won't let you in. It kind of leaves open the possibility that maybe if you were just wearing one of them, you would still get in. If you're not wearing a wig and you're not wearing a nose, then you can't get in. But this sentence really says, no, it, it, to get in, you have to have both. Notice a kind of cool thing that I don't always point out. But this formula is logically equivalent to this. We can switch the sides and write S arrow W and N. If you read this as a negative, you can always switch the sides if you change the values on both sides. And so we're dropping the tildes and switching the sides. And it turns out that if you read this as a necessary condition, it makes pretty good sense. A rubber nose, excuse me, a wig and a nose are necessary for getting into the sanctuary. So if there's even one that you don't have, then you don't get in. Bottom line is I know this stuff is really tricky. Let me clear off a little space and point out what I've pointed out in class. And that is, I really want to simplify this and give you an easier way to think about it. For most things, for most complex negations, I have said, identify the simple sentences and then use your intuitions to decide how many to negate. 
But because I know these situations where you have complex negations after if are so bad, I gave you some patterns to be on the lookout for. I said, if you see if not P and Q, then you may immediately s symbolize this as tilde P ampersand Q arrow. The word both is actually optional in this construction. What language would tell you to symbolize something as tilde P and tilde Q arrow? Well, that would be the language if not P and not Q. Or alternatively, if you saw if neither P nor Q. That's when you would write this. Now you might say, oh, gobbledygook, what is this? I don't want to memorize all of this. But notice what I'm really telling you. If it's a complex negation, after if, count the numbers of knots. If you have one knot, then use one tilde. If you have two knots, then use two tildes. Neither nor counts as two knots. I'm really trying to go out of my way to oversimplify this. And the point is, maybe if we oversimplify it and I get you to think about the sentences, maybe it will help the intuitions actually make this make sense. I, I must say, this next is one of my favorite sentences. Only if killing zombies is a necessary condition for saving the planet, would it be moral to assassinate fashion models and Republicans? It's not a very nice sentence, but uh, I, I do kind of enjoy it. Um, let's rewrite it. Only if Z is necessary for P. When I have necessary and sufficient or necessary and sufficient conditions, I like to write the whole phrase is necessary for because that's what my intuitions are going to work on. Only if Z is necessary for P, comma, would it be moral to assassinate fashion models and Republicans? What's going on with this sentence right here? In fact, you know, this is just a very simple M and are. This is not really a specially challenging sentence, but there's a trick that's important to recognize. Only if Z is necessary for P, M and R. For a sentence like this, if you can put in some parentheses to help you see the structure, I think that's definitely the thing to do. There is some obvious parentheses here, right? M and R, clearly a group. But it turns out that necessary and sufficient conditions also give you groupings. Z is necessary for P is definitely going into parentheses. Notice the only thing that's not inside parentheses at this point is the only if and the comma. And in fact, they're working together. The only if is working with the comma to place the arrow as the main connective. That's the main connective for the entire sentence. Now what's the rule for only if? The rule for only if says what follows it is the consequent. And what fo and that here the parentheses are helping again because what's following only if is everything in the parentheses. So that's the consequent for the entire sentence. Okay, Z is necessary for P. How do we symbolize that? Well, what is necessary is the consequent. And so Z is what is necessary. So the symbolization needs actually to say P arrow Z. And then the M and the R come up to the front like this. Now if you try to just read this back to yourself to check your intuitions, that's not going to work very well unless you remind yourself that this arrow is only if and that this one is a necessary condition. But what the sentence really says is that it would be moral to assassinate models and Republicans only if killing zombies is necessary for saving the planet. Remember, you have to read necessary conditions backwards. 
Okay, so this is the symbolization. A, a sentence like this is about breaking it into manageable chunks and then applying the rules. The rule for only if and the rule for necessary conditions is what really makes this sentence work. Uh, by the way, I don't have anything against fashion models. Studying hard is sufficient for getting a good grade, but it's not sufficient for understanding the nature of existence and leading a meaningful life. Good sentence to rewrite. So, what we're saying here is that studying hard, H, is sufficient for G. As I always say, I when I have sufficient necessary conditions, I like to write the whole expression is sufficient for or is necessary for. Is sufficient for because that's what helps my intuitions. So H is sufficient for G, comma, but it's not sufficient for understanding the nature of existence. This is kind of tricky. We haven't seen this a lot. But this it's, what's it referring back to? It's referring back to the studying hard. And so really to get this right, we have to say, but studying hard is not sufficient for understanding the nature of existence. So H is sufficient for G, but H is not sufficient for E. And actually, I, I didn't finish my thought, did I? Not sufficient in, for understanding the nature of existence and leading a meaningful life. So E and M. Here's what we really care about. H is sufficient for G, but H is not sufficient for E and M. This is the type of sentence in which putting parentheses in to see the obvious groupings and then applying rules is definitely the way to go. When I look at this, what obvious groupings do you see? E and M is one that's really obvious, but it turns out that sufficient and necessary typically give you groupings, and so H is sufficient for G, yeah, that's going together, and also H is not sufficient for E and M. In fact, the main connective is now obvious, it's but, and it's working with the comma, and that probably was obvious from the beginning, but if not, it's definitely obvious now. An ampersand is the main connective is the best possible situation because nothing needs to jump from one side to the other. And in front of it, we just have H is sufficient for G. What's the rule for sufficient conditions? Remember, the rule for necessary and sufficient are not about position in the sentence. It's not what follows sufficient. No, it's what is sufficient is the antecedent. So if I say H is sufficient for G, I'm saying that H is sufficient. Therefore, the symbolization ought to be H arrow G. H is sufficient for G. H is not sufficient for E and M. I left off the four, didn't I? H is not sufficient for E and M. Well, when I say that, again, I'm saying H. Here, I, the point. The, the not is actually the tricky point of this. H, but let's first just symbolize H is sufficient for E and M. And that would simply be H arrow E ampersand M. That is where we would start. Now what's this not negating? This is one of the most commonly missed things on tests. This not is negating the sufficiency. So in effect, it's negating the relationship itself. And so where does that tilde need to go? It actually needs to go outside the parentheses. In fact, think about what this is saying. H is not sufficient for E and M. That's the same thing as saying it's false that H is sufficient for E and M. The rule is this. When you see not immediately in front of necessary or sufficient, that's always going to give you a tilde outside parentheses with an arrow on the inside. Not immediately in front of necessary or sufficient is like saying it's false that 
something is necessary for something or something is sufficient for something. Okay, another good example of a sentence which is really all about applying rules. I think a most important thing that you can do for symbolization practice is make a list of all the rules that we have talked about. Things like this, things like unless equals if not, and of course the rules for necessary, sufficient, only if, etc. A hamster is not essential for a meaningful life. However, without one, you'll never know the joys of raising rodents. All right, let's rewrite the sentence. A hamster, H, is not essential. What's essential a synonym for? It's the same thing as necessary, right? Um, essential, required for, mandatory for. So I'm going to write is not necessary for a meaningful life. Is not necessary for L, comma, however, However is a fancy and, but I'll go ahead and write the whole word. Without one, you'll never know the joys of raising rodents. This is actually kind of a tricky little bit of stuff here. Without one, you'll never know the joys of raising rodents. Without what? Ah, without a hamster. The one is referring back to the hamster. So this is actually saying without H never J never is a synonym for not and so really what's going on here is without H never J this H gets repeated because of the one so H is not necessary for L however without H never J alright let's symbolize the sentence in this case Sometimes I start by putting in obvious groupings. Sometimes I start with main connectives. It kind of depends on what captures my attention. In this case, I see that this however, that's clearly the main connective. It's offset by two commas, and it means ampersand, and it's breaking up the sentence right there. These long-winded synonyms for and, like however, moreover, nonetheless, they're virtually always the main connective when they show up. Now in front of this, we've got H is not necessary for L. Okay, so we've got, I mean, with AND as the main connective, that's great because you have projects on both sides, nothing jumps from one side to the other. H is not necessary for L is our first project. How do you symbolize H is necessary for L? Well, the rule for necessary conditions say what is necessary is the consequent. So if I say H is necessary for L, I'm identifying H as what is necessary, and so it goes second. And it would be L arrow H. But what is the not negating? It's negating the necessary condition itself, and so that means we would have a tilde outside the parentheses like this. H is not necessary for L is the same as saying it's false that H is necessary for L. Not immediately in front of necessary or sufficient negates the entire relationship. We saw that in the previous sentence. Now we've got without H, never J. Without is really just a synonym for unless. And unless is a synonym for if not. So what we have here is if not H, never J. Ah yes, what follows if is the antecedent. If you turn on less into if not, notice what's following if right now? Not H. That's why the symbolization over here is going to be not H, arrow, not J. And then, of course, we'll need some parentheses like this. I don't really like this sentence. I must have been kind of depressed when I wrote it. Given that I don't like stress and I don't need the hassles, I won't teach both logic and ethics during the summer unless I get a teaching assistant and lots of money. Yeah, well, that's not going to happen. Okay, so let's rewrite this. If not S and not H, comma, if I don't like stress and I don't need the hassles, Comma, I won't teach both logic and ethics. 
that would be not both L and A, L and E, unless I get a teaching assistant, so that's unless A and M. This sentence has got all kinds of stuff going on in it. In fact, you know, it, it reviews all the trickiest things that we've talked about since the beginning of the semester. Well, let's see where to begin. My inclination is to get rid of this unless and stick in the if not as soon as possible. Okay, so if not S and not H, not both L and E, if not A and M. Oh my, what, what a messy, messy sentence. So now, can we put in parentheses and see any obvious groupings? Well, I'd like to say that we've actually got three of them. Not A and M, not both L and E, and not S and not H. I'm avoiding actually putting in parentheses because I don't want to try to give away what's going on at this point. Right now, what I'd like you to see is that we have two ifs, one, two, and three chunks. One, two, three. Ah, we know what that's about. We have got three. We, what we're doing is playing our favorite game. We played it earlier in this video. P arrow Q arrow R versus P arrow Q arrow R. And we know that this second one is logically equivalent to what? P ampersand Q arrow R. When we see that we have three parts and two ifs, we know that this is what we're doing. When we know we're in this situation, what we want to do is identify the R part, the final consequent. What is the final consequent of these three? Well, notice that the first one has an if in front of it. The third one has an if in front of it. So it must be the second one. Well, how do we symbolize not both L and E? Here it may help us to go back to the English and look at it because this is just a standard complex negation but it's one that we have to be careful of. I won't teach both logic and ethics. Well what are the simple sentences? I will teach logic and I will teach ethics. If I say that I won't teach both logic and ethics during the summer, am I saying that I won't teach either one of these and so I should negate both of them? No, I'm actually saying I won't teach both of them, so I'm, there's at least one that I won't teach. Here's one of these cases where the word both is applying to the group in such a way that it's just negating at least one. Things like this, people are notoriously bad about on tests. They see this, I won't teach both, and they think, well, that means that you're not going to teach either of them. But that's not what it says. It says I won't teach both of them during the summer. I might teach one, it's just that I'm not going to teach both of them. I know that this is a tricky sort of thing, but here's the deal. If somebody said this to you, and if, if I said to this to you, if I said, you know, look, next summer I'm not going to teach both logic and ethics, I don't think you would understand that to mean me saying that I'm not going to teach anything. I'm just, I'm not going to teach both of these things. There's at least one that I won't teach. All right, uh, uh, too much commentary there, Curtis. Um, if you know what comes last, then you can just put in the other parts in the appropriate order. Uh, and you don't typically have to change the order is what I'm trying to say. So if not S and not H, and then also if not A and M. Well, notice this is our least favorite type of thing. It's complex negations after if. But we have given ourselves rules for that as well. We have said, if you see, if not, and the word both is optional, but I'll write it here, if not both, P and Q, then you should just symbolize that tilde P and Q arrow. What language do we associate with tilde P and tilde Q arrow? That would be if not P and not Q. 
And the moral is, and I've mentioned this earlier in this video, is that if you see two knots, it's two tildes. If you see one knot, it's one tilde. So, if not S and not H. Oh, with this rule in mind, this is obvious that this is not S and not H. Arrow. And then over here, oh, one knot, so one tilde. Tilde A ampersand M. Arrow. Okay, so now we've got all the parts, all the right order. We've got all the parentheses right, except for the last set. Do we want a parenthesis around the front, a set around the front, or around the back? And we'll try them around the front, and we have to read this to ourselves and see if it makes sense. And when we put the parentheses around the front, we read this arrow as causes. So, does this sentence say, if not liking stress and not needing hassles causes me not to get a teaching assistant and lots of money, then I won't teach both logic and ethics. Boy, that's such a long, messy sentence. I had a hard time even remembering what I was saying as I said it. If not liking stress and not needing hassles causes me not to get a teaching assistant and lots of money, then I won't teach both logic and ethics. Something doesn't feel right about that. This causes doesn't belong here. Let's try it the other way. And of course that would say tilde S and tilde H in parentheses arrow tilde A ampersand M arrow tilde L and E this time with the parentheses around the back side so what I'm doing is I'm doing that pattern right there but of course if I want to read that it's better if I write it this way that means to take the first thing in parentheses tilde S and tilde H and then replace that arrow with an ampersand and then bring down tilde A and M and then, of course, I'm going to group those in parentheses and write tilde L ampersand E. All right, let's see if I can read this any better. If I don't like the stress and I don't need the hassles and I don't get a teaching assistant and lots of money, then I won't teach logic and ethics that felt so much easier to say it definitely corresponds to what this sentence says so either of these is 100 percent correct and of course to finish this off we know that if these are both correct there are two more things that would be correct you could write tilde a and m ampersand tilde s and tilde h put that in parentheses. Basically all I'm doing is switching the sides of the ampersand, right? Arrow tilde L ampersand E. That would work. Of course, going back up to the top, what that really means is it doesn't matter which of these two things come first. So if you wanted to put tilde A ampersand M like that, and then put arrow tilde S and tilde H, arrow tilde L ampersand and E. Well, I'm getting sloppy as the faster I write, and then put the parentheses like that. That would work as well. I know you wanted to know about all four of those, right? I know this all is making 100% perfectly good sense. Yes, yes, yes. I, I am tired of symbolizing too at this point. Um, I do hope that the studying goes well, and I hope these videos have, have made some small contribution to your understanding of something or other. No, I, 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 mean, I mean to be more optimistic than that. Good night.